You know Cheryl Burke from her 26 seasons on Dancing with the Stars. But behind the rhinestones and glam, Cheryl's life was filled with trauma, addiction, and abandonment. All of this has profoundly affected her life. Cheryl says she's never had a healthy, romantic relationship. On this powerful episode of Navigating Narcissism, Cheryl and I explore the roots of the painful, traumatic, and difficult life she's endured, what she's learned about herself, and how a conversation with me years ago led to a significant revelation about her own father. From Red Table Talk Podcast and iHeartMedia, I'm Dr. Romani, and this is Navigating Narcissism. This podcast should not be used as a substitute for medical or mental health advice. Individuals are advised to seek independent medical advice, counseling, and or therapy from a healthcare professional with respect to any medical condition, mental health issue, or health inquiry, including matters discussed on this podcast. This episode discusses abuse, which may be triggering to some people. The views and opinions expressed are solely those of the podcast author or individuals participating in the podcast and do not represent the opinions of Red Table Talk Productions, iHeartMedia, or their employees. Cheryl? Yes. (laughs) You and I actually met a few years ago Mm -hmm. when I was on your podcast and you talked to me about narcissism. Right. And even a foreshadow, you said, oh, you should have your podcast at the yes. time I did it. And here we are, and even I better, know. you're a guest. Who knew I was psychic? So okay. thank you. Of course. I want you to know how much you have affected my life in a way that you probably don't know. Um, but when you were on the podcast, mm-hmm. um, you did. we did talk about my real father who has passed. And um, you mentioned how, you know, the qualities of a narcissist, right? Mm -hmm. And it really put everything into perspective for me. Mm -hmm. And um, in a weird way, I was able to not necessarily validate, you know, his actions or anything, but to at least be able to label it in a way Mm -hmm. and have Mm -hmm. some sort of peace as to, okay, so my father was a narcissist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was a huge revelation. So thank you. Well, I appreciate that so much. I think having a frame for something Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's even just about lifting some of that self-blame and recognizing that it's a structural thing that was simply going to happen to anyone who was happens to be in the position you were in yeah. as his daughter. Mm-hmm. And it, it lifts us out of the story. We, you were still hurt by it. You were still affected by Absolutely. it. None of that still is taken am. away. Yeah. But it's a whole nother level when you feel mm-hmm. at all that you're partly responsible for it. Right. And that's the piece that the framework helps with. What is amazing about you is how much candor you bring when you share your stories and your experiences. And it is so important because people do see you. As a performer, people Mm -hmm. almost project a lot of stuff onto you. And when you stop being the person on the screen, the dancer, Mm -hmm. and you show your humanity, but also what you've been through with such vulnerability, you give permission to millions of other people to lift some of the shame off of themselves. So I always think it's powerful when somebody who has a public platform Mm -hmm. does that kind of open sharing. I don't think people quite understand what an impact that has. So I would say that on behalf of many survivors, thank you so much. And you've shared some really profound and painful experiences from experiencing, you know, sexual abuse as a child to even a journey of sobriety. So all of this is the kinds of things people grapple with but don't talk about. Thanks for creating a, an amazing outlet and resource for people because well, this is that. very important. Um, I heard you say recently that though it may seem like we're going through this as a collective of being able to talk about our traumas, at the same time we're not, mm-hmm. you know, and and on top of it all because of, you know, social media, there's amazing things about it, but there's also the negative um, things about it, which is, people having feeling like they have the right to judge you for yeah. for yeah. being vulnerable mm-hmm. and to say that I don't get affected um, by it to this day would be a lie. I'm already being vulnerable and then on top of it I'm being questioned as to why I'm being vulnerable Correct. or I'm oversharing. So thank you mm-hmm. for educating and mm-hmm. um, continuing to have these uncomfortable conversations. Well, yeah, I do appreciate that and I agree with you. I think that we often are a, 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 we're open to these stories almost only to the point where 
sort of we learn the information, but mm-hmm. we don't want to hear the emotion mm-hmm. and what it does to the person. You know, yes. it's always like what I call sort of trauma storytelling that we're just we want to hear the terrible thing that happened. But that's a tiny top of an iceberg. Yeah. The rest of it is how it shaped a person yes. and how it affects how they go through the world and how they've had to carry that burden and how they ultimately put some of that down and grow and heal and sometimes have setbacks. That totally. really is where the focus needs to be. But I think we get so caught up in the, tell me what happened. Okay, now I'm done. Yeah. And that or actually not believing is, yeah, them. Or, or not believing yeah, them. Yeah, that's the worst. Or when you bring the emotion in, people are like, oh, that's enough. We've yeah, heard yeah, it. Yeah. And we don't want to yeah. hear your raw emotion. Yeah. And so that's, that's definitely what... This is really a space about survivors, uh-huh. and I think all of these stories that come up, they're often, they're much more perpetrator-focused. We're so curious about people who do bad things, yeah. right? But what we don't really ever unpack is what happens to the person right. who experienced the bad things. And it is remarkable to me how uninterested we've historically been. Or who gets then almost made out to be the perpetrator. And that's actually something interestingly, yeah. Cheryl, we talked about with a, an expert of ours, Dr. Fried, who okay. developed a model of that called DARVO. DARVO is an acronym developed by Dr. Jennifer Fried and stands for Deny, Attack, and Reverse Victim and Offender. It is the way manipulative and abusive people respond to accusations. I like to think of it as supercharged gaslighting. When you face up to an abuser about their behavior, they will deny it, attack you for calling them out, and then flip to behaving like the victim and shaping the narrative as though you are harming them. It can leave many people in abusive relationships feeling as though they are the ones who have done something wrong. I'll never forget, um, I got sexually molested when I was a little girl, and I testified against him in court when I was like nine years old. And I remember even that time, as if it was yesterday, I just felt, I was here sitting in front of the perpetrator, right? And it wasn't just me, it was a you know, quite a few people. Um, and I, they wouldn't let my mom with me inside the court. And I don't, will never forget feeling like I did, I was doing something wrong, like I yeah. was lying. That's, I would say, the start of not necessarily trusting myself because in a way it was a way of grooming this man did a great job of doing that like it wasn't physical pain and it was to the point where I started questioning myself like as to like did he do anything bad because he Mm. never hurt me and then it didn't Mm -hmm. help being like testify testifying against this man and not necessarily I didn't feel like I was being believed Mm -mm. at all Mm -mm. and it was just a horrible feeling. I'll never forget it. It's a horrible feeling when you also stack that up. Nine years old. If any of us close our eyes and think back to how young yeah. nine is. Yeah, that's young. Right? Mm-hmm. Adult survivors of any form of sexual assault or trauma mm-hmm. rarely testify right. in their cases. So right. what you did would have been beyond the pale for even an adult. And it's understandable why nobody wants to testify in these cases. Right. These systems are all designed to give perpetrators their rights that's how our justice system is set up and to be doubting of the accuser that is the foundation of how this justice system is set up it's innocent until proven guilty Mm -hmm. well if that's the case that means an accuser is then being viewed through a suspicious lens right and that's particularly pronounced and profound when a person is bringing sexual trauma especially as a a child as a minor whose brain hasn't really developed in a way to fully integrate what this is children look to adults for safety a hundred percent that's what they do so when an adult violates a child's safety Mm -hmm. the child doesn't actually have a good template to turn to for that and so the child's Mm go-to is to figure out how they're complicit in this because that story allows them to be safer in the world at large otherwise the world becomes real dangerous real fast, Mm -hmm. all adults become potentially risky. You know, we talk about people being invalidating and traumatizing Mm -hmm. and frankly narcissistic. Systems are too. I think the judicial system is a great example of a system that is invalidating and traumatizing, especially for survivors of any form of sexual violence. Yeah, thanks for saying all of that. It just reminds me of people in general who um, suffer in silence because of the fact of um, either feeling like they weren't believed when telling their story or there's so much shame Mm -hmm. because of not being able to or feeling like they can't communicate it. You know, I was 
blessed, I guess, enough for my mom to put me into therapy since I was a little girl and mm-hmm. I haven't stopped. And it's mm-hmm. something that it's non-negotiable in my life. Um, but it has been really hard to put everything into words. My body, because I'm a dancer, yes. I have a somatic therapist. I have Good. a talk therapist. But um, the somatic is a lot easier. But I'm still learning how to be able to communicate this through talking. It's so interesting you say that, Cheryl, because trauma is very much encoded and stored mm-hmm. somatically. That's where we keep it. And, mm-hmm. and, and what we've learned in the last 30 years of trauma treatment is that that somatic focus is a game changer, oh right? You know, reorienting to our bodies. What's remarkable to me is you as tra- trauma survivor, mm-hmm. your body became your form of art. Oh my God. So what an ultimate way. way to heal, but <laughs> yeah. also... It's almost it, it's, it's really also weird amazing. too. You're like, yeah. but you're gonna stuff yourself in a dance costume when you've been mm-hmm. violated, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And be comfortable dancing in front of millions of people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. For people who are listening, you know, when we're talking about how we hold things somatically, we hold them in our mm-hmm. body. So trauma gets held in the body, and I've for been years, working for years. I mean, wanted, if yeah, not if, lifetimes. Yeah. And I have to say, over the years, it would be many times people wouldn't connect. It would be even mm-hmm. things like when people felt they couldn't speak the strangulation Hmm. in the throat, anxiety. It's felt in the gut. It's felt in the head. It's felt in the shoulders. And that's often where people would process it first, Mm -hmm. right? And it's then teaching people, do you understand? I always say that the brain... The mind often gaslights the body. Yes. The body's holding all the truth, and the brain's yes. like, no, come on. Like, you've yes. been drama, it's the body. Ego. Yeah. Right? It's that and ego. so, but yeah. I think that it's because You're the right. brain and the body are serving different functions. Yeah. yeah. The brain is trying to keep you safe. Mm-hmm. Right? So it's like, body, Spite, don't, don't tell me this. Yeah. Like, everything's yeah. dangerous. No, 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 no. We can't work with that. Right? Yeah. And so the brain's like, just chill, body, because I can't manage this much yes. threat. And the body feels the threat. One of the things we most we often see with trauma survivors is you can teach them to trust their body sometimes a little quicker than we can t- teach them to trust mm. their minds, right? Because this is where it's all held. Because you can't hide the feeling. You can't hide the feeling. You can't hide you the really sensation. Can't. But a lot of people don't connect the dots. Interesting. They have the sensation. They've had this experience. But what they don't realize mm. is that the stuff that's held in their body, the somatic stuff, yeah. and that their body is signaling something uh-huh. to them. And so that's why in some ways your body is an interesting early detection device, Mm -hmm. because I will tell particularly people who have survived any kind of trauma, whether it be physical, sexual, or even emotional, listen to your body, because your poor brain has been trying to run circles and and make sense of it. it does tell you, it does. And listen, and when you're feeling that, that might be a sign to say, you know what, I think I'm going to step out of this situation, because there's a lot of data there. It's like that feeling when you're like, do I I walk through this alleyway or not? Like, you just know, you you just Mm -hmm. need to give Mm -hmm. it a second and trust it. Mm -hmm. It's um, body awareness, um, just knowing when your stomach hurts or whatever it is, Mm -hmm. ouch, you ran to the door done that a few times mm-hmm. you know it, it hurts like mm-hmm. and just acknowledging it um but yes i'm blessed that dance was my form of com- i'm blessed first of all that my mom was able to um, afford my dancing career but also you know i my mom thought i was deaf growing up because i didn't talk at all mm-hmm. so i th- um she took me to a hearing specialist who said no um miss but your daughter's going through ptsd um, which is why she's not talking. Like, how, how? so this was even before um, the sexual abuse. I'm my just my ask, mom and yeah. dad divorced when I was two, so that was very oh. traumatic. Um, and though it was like yesterday, another traumatic event happened was uh, seeing witnessing my father with an, being intimate with another woman at such a young age. Though they were separated, I didn't put two and two together. So that was like my very first memory as a kid. Okay, so let's go backwards. <laughs> all right, let's go backwards. So you. You you were not talking. You you didn't really start no, talking late. until you were two. No, two, way three, after that. Three, four, maybe five. Five. Yeah, okay. All right. Five, so that yeah. would have been something that would have jumped yeah. out. Okay. Yeah. And so, but at two, you said your parents divorced. Right. Can you talk to me about that period of time? Because it sounds like that that was or already separated. A, or separated. Yeah. But that that's a significant event for such a young oh, child time. who has no language to even understand what was happening. Yeah. So my, what was all that like? My, well, it was interesting because my mother's Filipina. She was raised, long story short, in poverty and moved here to the States and created a nursing agency called Nurse Provider. So mm-hmm. she opened up a, her, the very first nursing agency, like how we ha- as talent have agents. So she was ah. very, very um, busy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I was born in 84, and that's when her company had just started. Mm-hmm. So there wasn't a lot of, I guess I was raised with my Filipina nanny. 
mm-hmm. more than anybody okay. as far as my parents go. So there's that. We're, fr- we're living in the Bay Area where I'm from. And I just remember going bouncing from house to house. So my father's home for a couple of days and then my mom, mm-hmm. you know, but then my Filipina nanny was with me at all times. Oh, so she'd go from house to back Correct. and forth. Yes, 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 yes. But um, but still, like, she wasn't able to drive. She didn't speak I English. See, so that was another reason why I didn't talk, because we had two different languages spoken in home. You had a lot going on, and that kind of... The chaos, the mm-hmm. multiple languages, mm-hmm. all of that. I mean, now yeah. we would probably have assessed a child like you very differently. Mm-hmm. But what I'm hearing is busy parents, yes. distracted parents. Yes. You're going back and forth. The only consistent through line in your life is My a paid nanny, nanny mm-hmm. who's didn't all, who didn't speak English. Yep. What I'm hearing is being affected, though, is attachment. I'm, I am totally anxious attachment. Okay. All right. And so let's talk a little bit about what any anxious attachment is because people can say, well, what does that mean if someone's right. anxiously attached? No. Yes. What does it mean to you before I launch into sort of a professorial what anxious okay. attachment is? I love this already. I could talk to you for weeks. Um, I have anxiety when it comes to, first of all, relationships, but abandonment issues. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because me and my therapist were talking about this in length, actually, about avoidant versus um, anxious. And Mm I am a little bit of both, but Mm -hmm. I'm mainly anxious. Mm -hmm. Though um, the avoidant had just started to happen because of the fear of uh, feeling needy and Mm -hmm. maybe Mm -hmm. feeling rejected Mm -hmm. because of my anxious Mm -hmm. attachment Mm -hmm. issue that I then quickly switch over to becoming avoidant. So Mm. it all, like, it's not either or. What does that look like when you become, so if you go... So like if if I feel rejected by, let's say, if I'm like, oh, let's cuddle, or like I'm becoming, I'm extra vulnerable, right, Mm -hmm. through my body, Mm. and I don't feel like that other person Mm -hmm. is open to it, then I will right away my wall mm-hmm. goes up mm-hmm. fast right and and so you know we're this a protective you're type, protect, right. yes i'm protecting myself and this kind of you know the kind of early inconsistency mm. and mild chaos you were living in will impact attachment so totally. you know the gold standard that what we hope for for everybody is a secure attachment of course and with a secure attachment the child feels safe mm-hmm. they feel that they're that they can they have readily available caregivers that they can beckon and make mm. needs known to, and they feel safe expressing those needs, and that those needs would not be rejected or the child would be abandoned. It's right. so interesting to you, yeah. you, to me, to see you. You literally gave this big exhale no, as I, I said it. that. Yeah. You know that that is as though something good. that you I w- want I and want wish and wish for, right? Yeah. Children can be, but then realize you know, that only I can do that for myself as an now, adult. Now, but yes. some children can yes. be securely attached to one right. caregiver and not to right. another. Of course. But when we get into the area, well, then we had my second caregiver who molested me. There so. you go. See, yeah. that, so that's what we we're going to get to. Yeah. Is that now, when a caregiver atta- engages in harm, mm-hmm. you were older than then. I was, you know, so yeah, a yeah, couple right? years. Uh-huh. So not much older, but those early, mm-hmm. early caregiver attachments, those become really profoundly mm-hmm. important. As other people yeah. come into the sphere of the child, it's still going to affect attachment. And the way they researched this was they would actually look at what's called separation behavior and reunion behavior. Hmm. So children being separated from their caregiver, usually in this research it was a mother, mm-hmm. how they would do it goodbye mm-hmm. and how they would do it hello. Oh, I was not good with the goodbye. Right. I was like, and I that's will the never forget attachment. it. I was, mm-hmm. My mom was dressed up in a ball gown and like, mind you, she worked, she was working like long hours I remember grabbing onto her ankle I'll never forget it and she was with her friends and mm-hmm. it was with any goodbyes any goodbyes I yes. suck and at it, it. it generalizes to yes. all goodbyes right yes. so the goodbye is chaotic and there's yeah. a lot of distress and it takes a minute to soothe the child yeah. then the child does her thing then when the child comes back with the caregiver there's this almost like oh, almost like a don't like you're back. Don't mm-hmm. leave me again. And almost like a like a they went frenzied through trauma. reunion, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. That's the only way I could yes, describe it. Yes, yes, yes. In the avoidantly attached child, yeah. When they when the point of separation comes, they kind of walk off. And when the parent comes back, there could be some tears, some agitation, but by and large, they remain disinterested. What are the parents like when you're avoidant attachment? They're, they're neglectful. There's it, much more. Uh, it's it's a, very much a more neglectful the difference? setting. Like neglectful versus just intrusive. being busy. Neg- well, that's ne- that's a neglect, but right. there's also there was intrusiveness too, right? Uh-huh, there was also uh-huh. like it's not as though you didn't think there was anyone there, right, right, right. You know, it's a it's that they were there they, and they were yeah, kind of they, like 
up, down, in, uh-huh. out, probably over-involved, under-involved, uh-huh. that kind of thing. That It's not like nobody there. Got and it. Can you get to the secure attachment? It I takes so. a lot of work. It but, does. You know, but yeah. here's the thing. You said you're in therapy. Therapy uh, yeah. becomes actually one of those places where the secure attachment gets created again. Right. You know, that the therapist is there on time and oh, they're there right. and available yes. no, and amazing. they don't reject you because you say something. No, yeah. And that if in long-term psychotherapy, that can be one place mm-hmm. for it. Really healthy friendships that persist for a long time we can have these safe secure bases we slowly start to create some people will say some of that starts for them when they have children Mm. that they become a secure base for the child now some anxiously attached parents can also be hovery Mm -hmm. so they really need to get their stuff in order before they have a child is a good way to do it have a dog first you know have a dog first but it can i think it can absolutely can be interesting it can be reworked in adult relationships but it has to be intentional it can't just be that you get lucky and you find a good friend it takes work so but then you said at the age of three Mm -hmm. i just want to understand what happened Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That you walked in, in on your father. Yes. And he was having sex with someone, obviously not obviously, your mother. Yeah, no, no. How did Looked that... Look like my mother. Okay, uh, okay. He had a type. <laughs> How did that... You obviously have a that memory That was traumatic. Of it. That's traumatic. Yeah, and I'll never forget as well, like, I remember, you know, because I was staying there, so I had to shower, as, you know, and I needed help. So I he'd make me shower with this, like, woman who was his secretary. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was pretty traumatic seeing that. And I just remember seeing, uh, opening the door and seeing just like the back of her. She had long black hair. It was, it's interesting. Like, and she was naked, obviously. This is how much detail I know. I was sitting in my dad's brown leather chair watching Sesame Street on PBS and I wanted him to change the channel. And I go in and there was like a crack in the door and then I saw him, you know, being with this other woman. And obviously I didn't know it was his secretary back then. Obviously I didn't know. I couldn't put anything into words at the moment. But of course it was traumatic. And I think that was the start um, of, you know, what I thought love was. And what what would that be? It would be all unhealthy, um, I guess, toxic traits of a man, which is a... um, narcissistic personalities, um, Mm -hmm. abuse. Mm -hmm. Um, and that it does, I don't just say that because of my father. I say this because of the perpetrator as well. The person who sexually, you know, abused me. And then on top of it all, like the pattern that's, that was my definition of love was the, um, man who wasn't available. Well, so that, the, that's what it is. It's the chaos, yeah. right? It love right. becomes but associated I was, I'm a, with chaos. I, I would still say I'm a recovering addict, but still, like, there is, that feels like home still sometimes. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. my lazy brain, as I say, which is just not me not being present or conscious as yeah. much, um, it, it goes back to that, like, easily. So that early instance, okay, you mm-hmm. walk in on your father. So your father, who is, in theory, these are the, his few days with you, he's not being an attentive caregiver. No. Instead, what he's doing is... You know, having this right. fling with his right. secretary. Right. You see this. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And he knows. I would assume he knew. Right. This one instance was, I mean, Cheryl, people have walked in on their, on, on parents, maybe oh, even sure. parents and someone else having sex, yeah. right? It's an image that often stays with people. Mm-hmm. That event was one. How did that connect to your larger relationship with your father? Because it doesn't sound like that that well, my dad one left. event was it. So, so he, he left, left the country for his ah, own okay, well, uh, selfish reasons. So my dad was a very successful lawyer in the Bay Area mm-hmm. um, and then followed his passion. And I won't say it here. It starts with the P, ends with the Y, but opened up a bunch of strip clubs. That's in, his passion. Right. Okay. Correct. It was. Rest in peace. I'm sure it's it's no longer his passion, I would hope. You, you never, never know. know what happens on the other side. <laughs> That's for sure. I can't tell you any different. I mean, I'm just assuming or maybe <laughs> dreaming that he's now like this. Who knows? Anyway, <laughs> rest in peace, Dad. But, um, yeah, so he had a bunch of strip clubs in Pattaya in Thailand. And uh, clearly he loves loved his Asian women and uh, opened up a bunch of strip clubs. I was exposed to that world because my mom wanted me to continue having a relationship with my father. Um, Didn't want to obviously, I guess, promote me not talking to him or seeing him. So it was like a once a year, it was a family getaway to Pattaya. Not at his strip clubs, but he did live on top of his strip clubs. Called bubbles. So when you would go to Thailand for these I know. vacations <laughs> on a top of bubbles, and with my stepdad, with my stepsister, my mom. Oh, so your mom? It was a would, family affair. So mom, <laughs> stepfather, sister. So you, my my mom remarried. Yeah. 
So would you stay on top of bubbles or would you? No, we would stay at the Holiday Inn. Okay, and so it's you... way nicer there. Just okay. FYI, than it is here. Okay. You stay at the Holiday Inn, but it was you were very aware of the whole what was you mean? I mean, you mean it ish. was clubs. It, it was, was clubs. clubs. I was never going in, in the them. club, right? Okay. And my dad was an alcoholic, so he was only able to talk to us in a um, civil way after five p.m. So we wouldn't talk to him before five and we would see him between the windows of five and eight. And he loved to have long dinners and long talks and conversations. I'd be jet lagged. I'd fall asleep wherever we are. And he would take my stepdad out once a year and it would be at one of his clubs. That's all I remember. And then the rest, we went to go see elephants. Like it was not um, very eventful. Okay. So so you, what that also communicates is that yeah. your father made a choice. He yeah. left his one daughter. Yeah. Okay. And when she's a very small child yeah. to pursue his strip club dream <laughs> in Thailand. Yes. So he's not doing this no. in the Bay Area. No. He's doing this on the other side of yes. the world and leaves you. For his own need. Right. With no no awareness, no reflection, no, no. empathy. And no care, really. No care. Yeah, mm -hmm. honestly. Like, I remember dance when I started in the ballroom dancing uh, competitive world, my mom signed me up to do this competition in Hong Kong. And we're like, oh, because it's close by. Mm. You know, your dad can finally see you in person. After all these years, he hasn't come to see you. And he, I'll never forget, I got a call the night before our flight, and he flaked. And that was very, very traumatic for me because he was just not available. And when he was, it was between the hours of 5 and 8 p.m. How, how old were you when that the, the ballroom dancing competition yeah, thing I was like had... 13 or 14. So all those years, you kept mm -hmm. maintaining hope around yeah, him. Yeah, of course. And it was interesting because to this day, um, I feel like my real father will always know more about me than my mom in a way because I felt like I was never judged by him because mm -hmm. he couldn't tell me what to do because he mm -hmm. was never there. As I got older, we would have long talks and conversations like as if he was a buddy mm -hmm. of mine. But still, uh, so much pain, you know, I, mm -hmm. I could and always still wanting to feel like I was being though I wasn't validated. I'm mm -hmm. still yearning for that, you know. Every child val wants yeah. that, though. I think that what we forget about children, because it's not comparable to describe what happens to a child mm -hmm. in a with a narcissistic parent mm -hmm. as what happens to an adult in a narcissistic relationship, right? right? The child can't be taught that the parent is never going to see you, get you, recognize you, mm -hmm. acknowledge you. I mean, he wasn't around. He wasn't in your life physically. So no. it wasn't a real safety need. Like he wasn't sort of like the one locking the door at night. No. But it was more of a, that psychologically we feel like we need these, we, we have to have these attachment needs and they shape who we are. Mm -hmm. I am valid because my parents love me, right? And so mm -hmm. the hope that a child keeps creating around that and when parents are chronically disappointing, as mm -hmm. many narcissistic parents are, and remember, narcissistic parents, they come in two forms. Mm -hmm. Either they're over-intrusive mm -hmm. and they're constantly Definitely in your stuff. That. You know, yeah. it wasn't that, right? And where then you have these detached yeah. narcissistic well, my parents. My mom was. <laughs> your mom was, right. So Love then you, mom. you're a detached, nar you're a detached narcissistic parent who will not... You know, they, they will think nothing of not showing up. They'll think you should just get over it. You're just, you're mm -hmm. a secondary thought. Yeah. If it had lined up for him and he had some reason to be in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. he would have shown up at your thing and expected right. to be the hero. it was fear of flying. It was paranoia, yeah. mm -hmm. like nothing to do with me, right? Fear of flying, but he managed to get to Thailand. No, right, nothing to do with me, yet I thought back then everything to do with me. Yeah, right? yeah so of you course. you feel like it, it's your fault. Everything is your right. fault. And then those are the men I dated. Mm -hmm. That's right. And that, that idea of everything your fault, that's at the center of classical mm -hmm. formulations of trauma like Judith Herman's work who studied children who've gone through trauma I've and in her work oh, is sort of seminal her. work on this idea of uh -huh. the child takes responsibility. What's her name again? Uh, Judith Herman. Okay. And that stays with the person mm. their li entire lives. And yeah. so, okay, so you've gotten interested in dancing and your mom has yeah. invested the money for you yeah. to take dance classes. Which is and cheap. Which is not cheap. Yeah. And now you're now you're competitively dancing. All over the world all at 13. Over the, amazing. So you Traveling were just really alone. good at this, obviously, yeah. which we now know yeah. for sure. But even at yeah. 13. Well, I was wanting to, like, that's my personality as, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an addict. Um, I'm a recovering addict. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I'm all or nothing, mm -hmm. which is why, mm -hmm. you know, my therapist and I have for years now worked consistently on the gray area because it is very black or white for me in my mind have you ever thought of all or nothingness like that almost to be a form of dissociation it's a oh way to not God. feel pain right girl you're speaking my language yes i just got chills absolutely i'm mm -hmm. really good at productivity mm -hmm. that's my new drug yeah. 
productivity mm-hmm. is actually the it's the, it's worst the drug, drug of the twenty first century. Oh my god! And I, everyone thinks you're a hero for engaging. They in are, this especially in this country, yeah. because I've lived mm-hmm. everywhere almost, mm-hmm. and and I swear this is the only country that celebrates the hustle, and it's actually nothing to celebrate mm-hmm. no, because agreed. with that comes stress. Yep. With that comes mm-hmm. to, oh my god! Mm-hmm. I mean. I could talk about that for hours, but mm-hmm. yes, and my mother was that, right? Mm-hmm. So is that she was raised in a Filipina family where vulnerability wasn't celebrated. Mm-hmm. It was ashamed, like you were not supposed to show that side mm-hmm. of you coming from the Asian culture. And then on top of it all, she numbed through productivity. Mm-hmm. I mean, she went from rags to riches, and that was her straight up her by herself hustle. I mean, again, motion is very good, but I think also having something that absorbs your mind, that's healthy, mm-hmm. something that absorbs your mind, yeah. but using that to numb yourself and in essence dissociate Even not unconsciously, so much. That's right, because right, you're not processing no. the stuff you need to process, no. and then you're doomed to keep repeating these trauma mm-hmm. cycles because you're not actually addressing Feeling. it. Right, but you're, so your numbing was coming through this competitive yeah. dancing. Well, then it was alcohol. And then it was alcohol. When did you start drinking? When I moved here. And t- when I started Dancing with the Stars in 2006. In 2006. When I was 21. You're so 21. I started when I was legal. Okay, so, wait, so you're legal. Okay, so you're dancing well, I had a spirit off ice on my debutante's ball when I was 18. Okay. So <laughs> you're, you would, you dance competitively. Mm-hmm. Dad's not in your life. Doesn't even My really stepdad is my dad at this your step, point. Okay. Yeah. So okay. Your He's stepfather. Amazing. Your stepfather is great. Wonderful. Still is. Yeah. So but however, important. he did, I mean, I'm not saying, I'm just saying mm-hmm. the facts here. He uh, the person who sexually molested me came from, you know, his side, I guess. came. He brought this man who was <sighs> taking care of his daughter. You know, I'm not blaming him by any means, but, but you know, I'm just letting you know the facts. Right. Mm-hmm. But that was also a disruption in Absolutely. safety. So in 100%. our minds, we, we pair things. Right? Mm-hmm. We learn things through association. So yes. much as you... You love him, and he's been a good person mm-hmm. in your life. He is associated with then yeah. bringing in this really harrowing yeah. experience into your life. Yeah. So, but it, but then what? You get to 18. Okay, well, and, you know, 13 to 18. Okay, so I lost my virginity at 13. Mm. You know, ballroom dancing is very um, intimate. Mm-hmm. We're basically dry humping each other just so that everyone knows this is how intimate it is. The ballroom industry it reminds me of the entertainment industry mm-hmm. a lot. Um, lots of narcissists, um, mm-hmm. lots of great things as well. It's all about the, you know, unfortunately, the way you look. And it's all about like, it's old school. It is a man's world in a way. The man leads, the woman mm-hmm. follows. Um, and it's like that in real life behind mm-hmm. the ballroom and all the glitz and glamour of it Mm -hmm. as well and we're all just hustling competing fighting for our lives for a stupid trophy at the end of the day i mean it's not like you win millions of dollars like if anything you're spending yeah for the costumes and everything which then is why you know like when it comes to traveling you know my mom obviously she worked her ass off you know and she paid for everything but not everyone can do that in the ballroom world right so like you know, these kids are, you know, sometimes dancing on the streets. And I remember doing that in Union Square once because my mom and I got in a fight. And she goes, I'm not I'm not paying for your airline ticket to England. And I dance on the street. I made like $2,000 with my dance partner, like just for the day. So it's possible, right, to do it. Yeah. But when you're in a, when you're a teenager, the hustle was already starting yeah. for me. Um, and I was going to England, England, just to um, quickly mention this, Blackpool was like our version of the Olympics. Mm. And that happens every May. Mm-hmm. And so you'd have to take political lessons. You have to like go there and train. And we would spend summers there. And my mom couldn't always come with me i -hmm. couldn't always have a chaperone because both parents were working uh full time and you know my chaperone was my stepsister which wasn't on honestly was not a great chaperone um i had to chaperone her at some point but like really it was like you are living this world of playing dress up and working your ass off blood sweat and tears and you're with this one person who's your dance partner so Mm -hmm. things are bound to happen Mm -hmm. and and so it, it was a dance partner yeah. yeah. Okay. And so that sounds like that was sort of, we'll say, normative in that world. Yeah. You know, not normal. I also but looked normative. like this when I was thirteen. So. Okay. Well. Yeah. So. So you. Okay. So then you know you were. I was very so, developed. You know. Okay. And that's young though. Thirteen very young. is young. To yes. Start, and did start, feel good. You know, to yeah. start have start having sex. Mm-hmm. And so you go from thirteen to eighteen. Mm-hmm. You're da- were you going to like? Did you do school, school remotely, or did you go back to school? No, like, I would go to high school. You go to high school yeah, and then I, do the dancing on the weekends. But then I was like living stuff. two lives, and then I had a boyfriend um, also 
after, you know, that first partner, because I had like a total of eight to 10 partners throughout my competitive world. Um, and Dance partners. Dance partners. Yeah, okay. no, no, not. <laughs> my sophomore year, I got into two very abusive relationships. That was when that started. That's young. Again, mm-hmm. young for these things. A, an adult person's brain can't yeah. process an abusive relationship. And after already yeah. having been through really abandonment by your father... Yeah. Abandonment might be a strong word for your mother, but she certainly was not in your life. You know what I'm saying? As much as she could, physically, physically not as much as she could have been. But she was there, and she was supporting you financially. Did the best she could. You were sexually Mm -hmm. abused, and now you're 13, having sex. You're young, and then you're you're in uh, you know, and you're in emotionally abusive relationships, and you're far away from home. And I'm looking out for outside validation, clearly by joining this. ballroom Mm -hmm. competitive Mm -hmm. world full of lashes rhinestones and spray Mm -hmm. tans so those are your teens and uh, i mean then you turn 18 right i mean that's sort Mm -hmm. of the magic adult moment did things shift in terms of you graduated high school i had a debutante's ball oh that's my mom's fault okay um (laughs) she made me okay i was very shy growing up in my teens Mm -hmm. but again dance was my way of communicating Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. that was the one thing I knew I was good at, I was never good at school. Mm-hmm. I wasn't curious and I didn't care. Mm. Um, and I was kind of a loner. So I was with this protective, jealous boyfriend mm. um, for most of my high school. Mm. And with that comes no friends. And yeah. then I also had my dancing life that I was kind of ashamed of in a weird way. Protective, jealous boyfriend was okay with dance world? Didn't know. Dad didn't know. He would know, but he didn't. But then I would just go back and forth because there was a certain time where my mom wouldn't let me be away from home. I see. So I had mm-hmm. rules to follow. Mm-hmm. And those were the de- times that I'd go to the dance studio. Mm-hmm. And because um, I knew he was going to be mm-hmm. jealous mm-hmm. and controlling mm-hmm. and protective. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So there were moments of like that. And then the makeup, breakup, makeup, breakup. And then there was another one. Mm-hmm. And then there was a dance partner that I danced with um, who was also abusive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was, yeah. And were then these, I moved to LA. Were these physically abusive relationships, both. emotionally abusive, both? Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's a that's a it's huge a yeah. burden to carry. And no one knew. So I didn't, at that time, I was not in therapy. Right. That's what I'm um, ask but I had a lot of older friends in the ballroom world mm-hmm. who helped me through, mm-hmm. you know, this. Right. Because I didn't feel comfortable enough to go to my parents. Right. So all of this is is unprocessed. There's now yeah. multiple unprocessed yeah. traumas at this point. Oh, yeah. What was your dad completely out of your life then? My real dad? Point? Yeah, your I biological mean, he dad. Was in Thailand. Uh-huh. Like, I think there was a moment there where we stopped talking for a few years, but it was a constant letdown from, yeah. from you know, and as yeah. I got older, mm-hmm. I saw it. Mm-hmm. But then I re- remember like that Hong Kong trip, I stopped talking to him for like a few mm-hmm. years. That was mm-hmm. a choice that mm-hmm. I made. And um, yeah. So, I mean, I wouldn't even consider him to be somebody I could call and talk to in a mm-hmm, way. Mm-hmm. But I did tell him everything afterwards, mm-hmm. after the fact. Did, did the two of you ever get on a more normalized relationship together? I mean, or not what's really? normal? I would visit him. You would? I would. And I brought my d- dance partner at the time and my dance coach. We went and then I we saw I saw his strip clubs really in like active it, happening face to face there when I was like 18, 19. And then I remember taking my um, ex-husband there when he was basically on his deathbed. Mm. Yeah. You mean your dad was on his deathbed? Yeah, basically, yeah. There. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, he stayed in Thailand for the rest of his yes. life. Okay. Yeah. So now this all sets you up. You're going into adulthood. You're continuing to dance, but you're also continuing to be in relationships. Yeah. Oh, I have, was never single. Okay. You were. Oh, you were never single. <laughs> no. So talk about that. Now, this is the longest I've ever been single. Oh, for okay. a year and a half almost. All right. Yeah. And Which, I choose to date myself right now. I really yeah. do not want to date anybody right. still. Okay. So what then if you were never single, what was that like? So much energy emotionally, like mm-hmm. an emotional roller coaster. Mm-hmm. But I was addicted to it. Like without it, I felt like my life was boring and mm-hmm. stagnant. Though that's my goal now to be boring, but not mm-hmm. boring. You know what I mean? Like that mm-hmm. feeling of just being okay and at mm-hmm. peace and at mm-hmm. ease was something that I was not necessarily... Uh, craving because it was so boring i labeled it as boring and yeah. you're not in love then for me being in love was um the drama that you see on tv that's trauma bonding yeah that's right there mm-hmm. that's trauma bonding that that the chaos becomes conflated yeah. with love and so getting into a relationship that doesn't have the highs and lows and the mm-hmm. good days and the bad days and mm-hmm. all of that when it's sort of steady People will say, well, that's a friendship or that's not love or yeah. I'm not feeling it. Well, or I see no my chemistry. mom and stepdad would do. I was like, oh, 
that's not love. They're mm-hmm. they they're definitely bored with each other. But mm-hmm. really, no, that's just mm-hmm. a healthy. I wish I would have seen that as a little mm-hmm. girl. You because I'm just curious about this because you were in so many relationships, one after the other mm-hmm. after the other. Was there a commonality between all of these people that they you were could, all abusive? That, that was the one. Okay, there you go. Not the, yeah, I was hoping you'd say they all had brown eyes, but okay. So the commonality is <laughs> no, right they were all it. abusive. Yeah, they okay. were all. They were all. Nar- most of them were narcissists, and the ones that weren't, I wasn't that into. Okay, so let me ask you this then, because you, it's interesting when you've had a life where you've had multiple relationships mm-hmm. with invalidating toxic narcissistic yep. people what attracted you to these people i kind of think i know the answer but i never want to presume every single one of them reminded me of my father okay well there you go it is a hundred percent true from the way either the way they look or or and um the personality traits i've been cheated on multiple times and knew about it and it was just a little tiny version of steve burke when did you have the insight that all of these men that you've dated over the years somehow reminded you of your father so this was just maybe five six years ago oh recently because oh, i've so i am i have two therapists i have a somatic and then i mm. have a traditional one uh dr wexler now for a decade mm. every week and mm. 10 years ago so i was still drinking so she, when she would try and talk to me about it, i just what she told mm. me i wasn't having it so Mm-mm. Mm-mm. none no. of it so in those early years you were just going from man after man who had some Blindly. quality of them yes. resembled your dad. Absolutely, yes. The same chaos, betrayals, mm-hmm. all of that over it's and like, over. It's uh, like clockwork, yeah. Okay. Yeah, every single and, one. And it must have been hard, though, to, to start, stop so many relationships. That 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 takes a toll on you, too, and it kind of co- makes, makes it sort of concrete that this is just how it is. Well, I don't know. So this is what it was. I could tell in my body that when it was a nice guy, I was disgusted mm. by them. Really disgusted, disgusted, literally that much. So disgusted, which is, just shows you how much I really loved myself, which was not a lot, right? So because I didn't know that, mm-hmm. I didn't know that mm-hmm. it was very foreign to me. Mm-hmm. The only thing that felt like home was these abusive, mm-hmm. whether it be emotionally being gaslit, and that's what I was attracting, and that's what got me going. Okay, so let's go back a little to mm-hmm, to what mm-hmm. was happening then. Yeah, when the abuse was happening in the relationship, I didn't like the physical abuse. Just, okay. I just want to be clear with anyone right. listening. Obviously, yeah. that's not something that I wanted. No, 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 yeah. no. But when when let's use the emotional abuse because mm-hmm, that's mm-hmm. what's so common yes. in narcissistic relationships. Yeah. When the emotionally abusive moments were happening, which I'm guessing were things like dismissiveness and mm-hmm. criticism and mockery jealousy, and validation, control. jealousy, yeah. control, manipulation, gaslighting. Yes. What was the story you were telling yourself at those times? Oh my God, I don't think I was even aware back then. I don't think I was having that dialogue. So it was almost like this is just a relationship. I mean, I watched Pretty Woman when I was too young, obviously, but um, my... (laughs) My nanny, who didn't speak English, she watched three movies. It, well, Dynasty wasn't a movie, but Dynasty, um, and I was watching this with her, Pretty Woman and Sound of Music. Sound of Music's more like it, but at, like, between ages three and six, like, I shouldn't be trying to look like Julia Roberts like and dress like a hooker and say, Cheryl, you know, it was interesting. I started this YouTube channel during the pandemic and I went through all my mom's VHS tapes. For those of you that don't know what a VHS tape is, look it up. (laughs) Uh, And I saw myself. This was insane. Okay. I saw my molester there having like Thanksgiving dinner with all of us and how avoid like and how nobody was paying any attention to like how creepy this man was hovering over me and, you know, the kids there. And then on top of it all, I saw myself cut to another scene do I look pretty? Do I look? And I was like, oh my, this poor child. And that was me. Yeah. And I and I can tell that I was being influenced. And I yeah. do have to tell you that Pretty Woman, I can recite it like it, like I wrote the script and it's just not okay. <laughs> pretty Woman is not okay. And that that's maybe one day we'll do an episode oh on God. all the reasons like, Pretty Woman is not okay. No, I seriously, so, yeah. though I still love it, but it's not okay at that age. <laughs> right, right. I, I don't know that it's okay at any age. Really? Okay. To actually, you know, I mean, when you really think about it, no, right? you're right. I think you're they right. try to make it, the, what was the feminist line? Like, um, av- you know, the, one day the, she, the, the prince rescued her, but she yes. rescued him first. I'm like, oh, no, honey, it's too late for that line. I think we have, we have just, <laughs> we've done too many problematic things. You are not cleaning this film up with one oh, little rescue no. line. No, exactly. So, but I do think, though, that what you do bring it to is this, this sexualization. <laughs> yes. That you were sexualized as a yeah. child. And this wasn't being seen. I mean, I mm-hmm. think that that is something we see in any of these sort of what we could call traumatogenic mm-hmm. environments, especially where sexual abuse 
abuse is happening where it is this this unawareness yeah. and this disconnection from the experience of the children, mm-hmm. from the dynamics within the room. Everyone's sort of so caught up oh, yeah. in their own thing yeah. and their own shtick and all of that. That's It's a real it's it a real so problem. It was so hard for me to watch this. Yeah. There was so many emotions going through my body from anger, resentment to I wanted to reach through the VHS tape, the TV screen or my mm-hmm. laptop and just be like, shake everybody. Like, what don't you see it? This was an interesting thing. I don't know if I recommend it because if you do do this, I have somebody with you that you trust because that was, it was very, it was like reliving it, but then it was healing mm-hmm, mm-hmm. all at the same time. Well, I think it can be because I think that these things can be, you can see it, you can understand what the influences were, you could understand you were too mm-hmm. young to see it, you yes. couldn't make sense of that kind of a storyline, yeah. how it get con- gets confused in a child's yeah. mind. So now you're going through this sort of series of bad relationships, they're beginning and they're ending. When these relationships would end... Who was ending them? Well, there's lots of ending and coming back together because I uh, loved the reuniting. So sometimes know? it would be the same guy for mm-hmm. a back and well, forth yeah, for a while. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay. Especially this okay. high school one. It Got was it. like, and I mean, to the point where he was like stalking me and I was like, uh. But I always had somebody um, ready for me to pick up the pieces, mm-hmm. if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Go from relationship. I'm not kidding. I went from relationship to relationship. Mm-hmm. So I went from like my, this high school boyfriend straight to my last partner. There was never really a huge gap of transition for me. Right, Like right. I, in a way, uh, spaced it out or I didn't have the strength to leave somebody until I had somebody mm-hmm. else lined mm-hmm. up. And that's, mm-hmm. That was the pattern. So the relationships became a place of soothing. They became oh, again, I, more of that dissociation, right? Yeah. That, that, you know, more of the numbing that you yes, could have. no matter what. But because mm-hmm. you didn't have to simply be with yourself. Right. That's How what it stopped I? you from, yeah. be, from doing that. So, yeah. um, okay. So I, I, get a, I have a very full picture here. Okay, good. Okay. The relationships continue in this cycle. Stop, start, they come, they go. Chaos, abuse, mm-hmm. gaslighting. You're not seeing it. There's no no part of you mm-hmm. saying, what am I doing? Okay. And mm-hmm. that's very common. So, yeah. You know, very, very yeah. common. There's nothing unusual about that. Well, the worst was like those silent treatments. Oh, my God. That yes. would kill me to the point where actually it was interesting. Those, like depending on how long the silent treatment went on, like if it was for my dance partner who like I was there in New York with and moved from the Bay Area to New York. And I remember, I'll never forget, like over Thanksgiving, it was like he was gaslighting me and he wouldn't talk to me and didn't talk to me for like a week. And I would call my mom Mm -hmm. and cry and tell her. But when it comes to any other type of abuse, like physical or mental, I never called my mom. I was just realizing this as I'm talking to you. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you think that was? Why do you think that I, that, because it's silent treatment. That was like more painful than anything. Because that was an abandonment. Oh, of course. That was what my dad did. Mm-hmm. 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 There were, it means it was the loss of engagement. Yeah. I felt was what the so fear was alone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I felt very, mm-hmm. I felt abandoned. Period, mm-hmm. point blank, yeah. You know, the, the silent treatment is, it's a common gambit in narcissistic mm. relationships, especially once they realize it works. Right? right? It's very passive aggressive. Mm-hmm. And what I'm about to say is going to sound very cynical. Even I, I mean, it's just, <laughs> even I'm surprised by this is cynical, okay. but it's a, they get a lot of bang for their buck on that mm. one, right? For no effort. And they, and once they learn it, it works, they're going to keep doing it, right? Because they're like, oh. Like works this, meaning like I'm affected. You're getting person. a rise yeah. out of the other person. Yes. Does that make yes. sense? Yes. And then you start to control right. them. Yeah. And now the silent treatment isn't punitive for everyone, but for most anyone who has even a secure attachment, it's uncomfortable. Of but course. if you have an anxious attachment, it's it is really like flaying triggering. a person alive. Yeah. And so because it's the ultimate, it's it's worse than abandonment. Yeah. Right? Because it is true abandonment. You they're not communicating with you. They've None. ceased to exist. Yeah. Right? That's the yeah. ultimate fear. Worse is when you're working with the person mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. And then you're living in like a little box in Harlem and the only door separating the two of you is a bathroom door. Mm-hmm. And then wow. It was mm-hmm. powerful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it got me every time. Like I felt paralyzed. I don't think I've ever felt that much, I think, pain mm-hmm. or par mm-hmm. like paralyzation Mm -hmm. since that time Mm -hmm. being stuck being frozen like you can't (laughs) that actually is a sympathetic nervous system response Hmm. right when we think of how you know the sympathetic nervous system is an animal in a mammal it's in a human being and it's fight Mm -hmm. flight freeze Mm -hmm. and fawn those are the four therapist says that i'm addicted that i only know those feelings Mm -hmm. so still to this day well all it's 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 a response when you think something catastrophic is happening or not right or not but (laughs) see the thing is the silent treatment when you think when we think about the sympathetic nervous system it's it's the same reason why 
a zebra is able to run away mm-hmm, from a lion, mm-hmm. right? Everything gets mobilized. All systems shut down except the system that are going to make those that zebra's legs move mm-hmm. as fast as can be away from the lion. Once they're out of harm's way, they go right back to parasympathetic functioning well, they, just and they graze. Yeah. They're just chill, yeah. right? Yeah. The, and so a lion chasing the zebra is a true mortal threat. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> A person giving you the yes. silent treatment is actually not a mortal of course, threat, no. but your brain interpreted yes. it, interprets it that way. But when the, you keep turning the sympathetic nervous system on and off, on and off, fight, you know, freeze, 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 freeze. So it's not good. There's for you. all this wear and yeah, tear on the body. Of course, I, amen, sister. Mm-hmm. Amen. That's what it is. It's the wear and tear. It's not as simple as like, oh, I'll just keep fight, fighting and freezing. No, 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 (laughs) no, no. no. You don't want. There's an opportunity cost there. So, is is there a way now to get a little deeper on this? Is there a way to be addicted to it? To the that those those responses. I think that what I don't know that you were as addicted to the sympathetic response. like Like I only know that. I, I always use the word addiction very carefully when it comes to sort of these relational cycles okay. because it turns mm-hmm. the person being harmed into a mm, active a actor yeah. participant Okay, in okay. It. I hear Does that you. make sense? Yes, thank you. Uh-huh. And, and so I always steer away from that because I think that languaging has been used Too to, to use a disease model to capture okay. a... A person who's going through psychological manipulation. I hear you. I hear you. Two so separate that's things. separate. You know, yes, but it's also I hear you. it's 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 not putting survivors in a passive no. role. Yes, but yes, you yes, only yes, knew yes. what you knew. Yes. And for you, the relief of tension that would come mm-hmm. when the person would come back around was still the fantasy you held around the father mm-hmm. who was not going to leave, who was going to show up, who's going to come to Hong Kong, who was going to be there, who was going to be a decent human being at mm-hmm. some level when you needed him to be a father, yeah. that men could be safe. Yeah. But your templates for men across the board oh, were unsafe. And even totally. though you loved and cared about your stepfather, yeah. he brought danger into your life unwittingly. Oh, yeah. So you see what I'm saying? So it's like all of that became yeah. danger. Yeah. And so every man, you, then. yes, then yeah. you, and every man and every man behaved in a way mm-hmm. that that was represented dangerous that. that represented that because so, that's all I knew. Right. And so the hypothesis kept coming and mm-hmm. then the safe men were disgusting. Yeah. So you weren't yes. interacting I with know. them. Isn't that crazy? Right. It's not crazy. It actually kind of makes sense. I know it's not right? crazy. Yeah, no, totally. It does. And it, it does helps make more with sense. Um, feeling more compassionate towards myself. So you said you haven't been in a relationship for a year and a half. Well, I, yes. After my divorce, okay. I've been single. So you got married. Mm-hmm. May I ask how long you were married for? Two years. Two years. Okay. Mm-hmm. And how long? And how long were you together before the marriage? So we were together in the beginning when I first moved to LA. I would say 2007 for a couple of years. Broke off. Broke up for 10 years. Reunited for a year and a half. Got married. Okay. All right. So it was on and off, on and off relationship. Yeah. And then you got married. Yeah. Did you also find yourself repeating some of your same patterns yes. in this relationship? Okay. So. I'm not saying anything about that person, right. but mm-hmm. yes, what you're asking the, the question. The similar patterns. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. For sure. They looked very much like uh, your father <laughs> yes. and this person. I mean, so, I mean, he would agree too if you heard this. So. so you have not had a relationship with an adult man, an intimate romantic relationship with an adult man that was ever healthy at this point? No. No. Okay. All right. So... Do you have hope that you can? Yes, but I have to get myself healthy okay, first. Yeah. Got it. All right. So it's not as though you've ruled that out. Because Cheryl, there's people in your position will sometimes say, I'm out. I fold. This is not my game. And then what I'm they not do? doing it. I'm gonna be alone forever. Oh. Well, I can only live right now, right? Like I don't I mm-hmm. can't tell the future. However, no. I'd love to get married again. I but mm-hmm. let's this is another thing I have to work on at therapy. I go from like zero to a mm-hmm. thousand. Mm-hmm. Um so, of course, I still believe in it. I mean, I don't know if I know the definition of of what a perfect relationship is, but I know that I will continue the pattern if I don't change myself. So let me ask you this. What do you think a healthy relationship looks like? Two individuals. <laughs> That's very important. <laughs> I'm writing these Because I thought that okay. uh, we were one here. Okay. The notebook doesn't help, so they should take that off the fucking... Sorry, excuse my language. Oh, no, you can, you can say, <laughs> talk away. The notebook, you mean the... I, the, the, the movie. The movie I, needs to go away. All these that, movies about we re- love. We could <laughs> make a dysfunctional movie. Or is it dysfunctional? Playlist. I think dysfunction is normal. So I maybe, don't know. He was really stocky in the beginning of the relationship. The notebook? Yeah. <laughs> I heard that. You too. <laughs> no, Ryan but don't Goss- you think like oh, he see, jumped, loved, he oh, climbed see, up the Ferris wheel. My brain that versus your felt brain. Like, you see, like I, I was like, loved it. boundary violation. Oh, 
she's she's like, saying no, no, no does not mean yes. I was like, why, why does that happen to me? No, 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 <laughs> stocky, stocky, stocky. <laughs> And they've romanticized uh, and like, Ryan I'm going to keep coming by and I'm going to keep coming by That's and insisting right. and you're about oh to marry God, someone else. Right. So I'm going to keep coming oh, by. I have to watch it keep again coming now. By, keep I coming by. Keep coming by. I really should have healthy movie night. No, really. You should do like a rewatch. A screening yeah. and we'll come together and say, can we talk about why that was not healthy? No, that was so Anxious romantic. Anxious attachment. Avoidant attachment and psychopathic uh, personality traits. Like that's definitely what you should do. Well, I think what happens is it's an ends justify the means <laughs> kind of thing. Like, oh, they were old together and they yes. had the kids and they had the this and then you know and then whatever. Don't forget that they had the, the, they had the, 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 the shower, the shower sex and the swans and the water. But ahead of all of that the was the stocky yeah. fair behavior, right? She had a terrible but mother. See, that's and what all I. That. Thought. I seriously, I mean, it would get me every time that stalkery behavior. Like, wow. in a good okay, so, th- so that was a no good, to self, yeah. no. Cheryl. If don't somebody's behaving like a snow stalking, if somebody climbs a Ferris wheel, don't so date them. It actually reminds me of how I almost, like, how I basically, in a weird way, the stalking from my ex was actually in. It, it was actually enticing. Okay, so it's good. And here's the thing. I think it's so important you say that out loud, right? Yeah. Because there's absolutely no shame in no. saying that because you're saying like there that was, was something. That was my definition right, of love. That was your definition yes. of love because you know what it was? It was almost like it, it was unmistakable, yes. right? So it, it's like a volume button. If something's at volume 90, you're going to hear it, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas anything more subtle that that's, um, I yeah. don't know about that, but like mm-hmm. because of that, not being able to get that consistently, especially from your father. Yeah. There was no ambiguity. Mm-hmm. Stalking is like, oh, you're into me, right? Yes. So it becomes this massive overcorrection. <laughs> yes. And so it's this, I, it's really important that you yeah. say, like you, and I, I think for people to say, well, I don't want to say that enticed me because then that makes me look bad. No, it doesn't. No. It, it helps you it's understand yeah. what was yes, happening. Yes, 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 and yes. then the work becomes un. You know, unraveling, un- it. Un- yeah, yes. unpacking why that would have been enticing because many, a many lot of people, people feel say like they're a they, lot, like they must feel yeah. like they're crazy. Honestly, well, no, uh, what a lot of people feel is that, and I get this: is Dr. Romney? Are you kidding me? Like, I, 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 I feel guilty. I feel dirty. I liked love bombing. Yeah, I'm like, no, love bombing's you. great if you could find Wait, a respectful. That's the whole full court press. Baby, you're my everything, presents, dinners out, yeah. take, you know, showing up a lot, texting you 25 times a day. I yes. can't stop thinking about you, right? Go right? Go and so See, I'm not I'm not my love language is not gifts, but it's definitely But um, you know what I mean? The intensity, <laughs> yes. the the yes. the flowers, no. the night out. Got the, me every time. Yep. And so, somebody said, "Well, is there ever healthy love bombing?" And I mean, if you could find a person a who is <laughs> Nice, kind, Six respectful, gifts. all that disgusting stuff yeah. that you call yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, right, right, right. And Those does not all love, of that. That's not love bombing. You tend, they tend not to go together. Like a healthier right. person's going to have a little bit more of a like normal trust. pace. Go, right. So right? let's talk about the healthy relationships. Okay, so, so you've only okay. given me two individuals, right, 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 Cheryl. Right, right, so right, right, we got right. to wait. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Two individuals. Oh, oh. Okay, trust. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, is accountability. I've realized mm-hmm. this recently that I can't even have friends who don't hold themselves accountable. Good. It's great. Okay. Supporting each other, obviously, as someone who is not jealous in that sense of your career or success. Um, very uh, secure attachment would be great. Wanting to evolve constantly, learn, mm-hmm. grow, um, and patience and <laughs> kind, cute would help. I'm mm-hmm. kidding. Mm-hmm. Um, That's fine. And uh, successful, their own life. Successful, meaning not just like the amount of money they have in their bank account, but successful, like the confidence that they have mm-hmm. from within. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So good listener, a good listener. Okay. Would be great. Great. I mean, I can go on all day. These these are the things that make a healthy relationship. Two individuals, and by that I understand what you mean. Oh, not two uh, yeah. people are so enmeshed. We're not like that, one. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Yeah. Not. So two people that where there's yeah. a sense of separateness, but you know, and but, all in, like hundred percent, hundred. There's no right. 50-50 mm-hmm. in my eyes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Trust. There's trust. There's accountability. It's the two people support each other. There's a sense of safety, a uh, growth orientation, yes. patient, kind. That you find them cute. And yeah. These are things that describe a healthy 
person. Some of this could describe. Oh, you're asking about you know, relationship. Relationship. <laughs> what, it, what makes a healthy relationship? I think really, though, for me, I think just because I only can talk based off my experience, but it is allowing for the other person to be their own person. Okay. I All think right. that is a big thing for mm-hmm. me. I tend to mm-hmm. um, get very... Uh, consumed got it okay so i got whether that whether it's a person or a job right what else? so um uh communication okay. is key mm-hmm. um what does communication mean to you well responsive communication would help meaning like you know there's a there's a set so i'm also this weird uh not weird this very i'm very like to the second mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. with time mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. When someone says they're going to be there and they're not there at that time with no phone call saying that they're going to be late, it really irks mm-hmm, me. Mm-hmm. So then I, then my brain starts to think, oh, my God, they're cheating. Oh, my God. Like I fall down this rabbit hole oh, so of it's, shit. It, which yes. could, and, and it's interesting you go there because it's you could take but, it as right. they don't call you. It's like they're, <laughs> they're, they're actually not respectful of a standard that I put out there. Oh, no, 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 no. Which is what they're doing. And that, and that totally. is enough for it to be a That's problem. That's a healthy brain. Yes. Right? Yes. That's enough for it to be a problem. Yes. Okay? So I'm hearing so far that you've got here, it's we're going to talk about hard. a fancy word, it's but a it's a good fancy word. Okay. There's a term out there called intersubjectivity. It's hmm. used by a, a guy named Dan Shaw, who's a therapist who does fantastic work in, um, in uh, narcissistic relationships. Okay. But the concept of intersubjectivity is the idea that two people can be in a relationship and have their own experience and perceptions uh-huh. and simultaneously also recognize that the other person is having their own experience and perceptions, okay. right? So that's kind of the opposite of gaslighting, uh-huh. right? So simplest example, you go out to dinner with somebody mm-hmm. and he says, this was absolutely terrible. And you're like, oh my gosh, like this was the best lasagna I've ever had. Yeah, two different, right? Yes, yes. And you don't say to yeah. him, so you're wrong. There's no way your oh, right. your your right. pasta could, or he couldn't turn to say, there's no way your lasagna was good because my meal was bad. That would be a great example of there not okay. being intersubjectivity. No, I hear it's an you. overly simple example, Got it. but it's that capacity to do that. Mm-hmm. That's a core pillar here. And then you talk about communication. Be so, so what you're talking about also though is respecting boundaries and and yes and respecting boundaries and also i think transparency mm-hmm. is very important okay right. yeah right and that goes back to the trusting yes, and of the course. accountability yes and so but a lot of the stuff you're laying out here interestingly cheryl is very much related to stuff like trust boundaries oh, i think safety, that's my number one trigger, right it's yeah. understandable mm-hmm. because that's all going back to that secure base kind of stuff okay safety is everything to people who've been through trauma not to everybody and, and, in general and, um i think that for everybody in general they already have that internalized course, sense of it so they're there. it's already they, they yeah. sort of feel that they expect that that, that is <laughs> there's a risk in that too though because oh. you know if something terrible happens to them they may go through the world as though it's a little bit Safer. I, I I'll put it this way to you. I'm a trauma you. survivor too. Not not nearly okay. at the level you have, but definitely a trauma survivor. And I definitely go through work a little bit like a military. Little, what's you know? Yes. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. Hyper vigilant. Hyper vigilant. No, it's never. It's not a good. I mean, if you were to label it's it, not, it's not but good. I for am you. so, and I don't. I think the ballroom community, the competitive, because we dance all on the dance floor together. So my hyper vigilance is quite mm-hmm. scary. What do you mean by scared? Because to me, it's a normal trauma response. But I'm so vi- too vigilant to where, like, it's hard for me. I don't know if there's such a thing, but, like, I am too uh, aware of my... Well, it's exhausting. Paranoia, almost. Well, I-, I think that it's exhausting. If it's paranoia, if you if it's, if it's you think it's resulting in people no. coming at you no. or harming you. I used to. Okay, so that's come down a little bit. Oh, but a lot of it. Then it's the idea is that, but uh, hypervigilance is exhausting. It is. So, right, you, you almost yes. want to view it as when you have too many apps and stuff open on your phone, your phone's running slow. Yeah. That's what hypervigilance does. Right. It just slows you down and it, it, it completely depletes your bandwidth because hmm. you're like, and there's a thing over there and there's a sound over there and there's a this and yeah. there's a that. Whereas, and it, it, and it saps our capacity to be mindful. Right, and since my sobriety, it's been even stronger. So talk about that. Talk about your journey of sobriety because you, you had talked about how y- you are sober. Mm-hmm. So around 21, you had Five your first drink almost, and then yeah. what happened? Um, and then I used it, when I first started drinking, it was mainly to calm my anxiety down mm-hmm. from paparazzi. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It was pretty bad when I first came here in 2006. Um, my dance partner, just to give you some perspective here, was uh, Nick Lachey's little brother, Drew Lachey. This was mm-hmm. during the height of him and Jessica Simpson's mm-hmm. divorce. Mm-hmm. So I come here 
from New York at the time, and I had no voice. Like my, I had no opinion. Didn't know what my favorite color was. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, people wanting to ask me a question when I was so used to taking the back seat mm -hmm. and being mm -hmm. a follower, not mm -hmm. a leader, was an adjustment. So my anxiety was through the roof. Mm -hmm. Though I couldn't even put words to it at that moment. Yeah. Um. So dr alcohol helped. Yeah. Yeah. But I was yeah, a yeah. functioning mm -hmm. alcoholic, so no one mm -hmm. knew mm -hmm. that I was even. I looked. I mean, I was normal in their mm -hmm. eyes. So you didn't have impairments at work. It's not like you missed rehearsals or oh, never. shows or anything no. like that. Okay. So, but no. but it was the drinking got out of control. It got out of control to the point where I was drinking seven days a week. Mm -hmm. Now I never. When people ask me what my rock bottom is, I, it's almost like my rock bottom was the fact that I was at my height of success when I was drinking. Mm. and that I never really, my rock bottom, if you were to think about it now, for me at least as a sober um, person trying to stay sober one day at a time, if you, if I think back like when big things happen, like my divorce or, um, you know, leaving Dancing with the Stars, when something uh, mildly trauma, traumatic, I guess, because I don't know if you want to, I don't know if you, you don't measure it, but if anything traumatic like that or anything that changes in my life that's drastic, um, I do at times think about drinking and then I think about, you know what, fuck it. I was the most successful when I was drinking anyway. Mm -hmm. So that to me is a rock bottom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily checking into rehab. Right, right. So you got sober mm -hmm. on your own. You did 12 yeah. step? Yes, I'm still, mm -hmm. I'm still very much mm -hmm. involved. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a sponsor, and to say it's not a battle, it would be a lie. But I quit basically for vanity reasons because I started as soon as my dad died. I came home, had a drink, and I just I busted out into hives. Mm -hmm. And I this was the, right before my engagement party, and so I decided to stop because of vanity reasons. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, any port in storm, I would guess though those hives were probably for they stress. Were, Yes. Right, and you and you 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 co-located them with the alcohol. So my body was whatever it takes. Yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. I think that Reacting. a lot of things were happening at the same time. Yeah, and I didn't know how to feel mm -hmm. it. So, mm -hmm. so now you have to cope without the alcohol. So you've taken one form of numbing away, but you've acknowledged though that another form of numbing is the. You've also taken you've taken two forms of numbing away, the men. the chaotic relationships mm -hmm. and the men. And the alcohol. Mm -hmm. You've now turned to work. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and or that, you know, busy. or yeah. staying busy, yeah. that can be a tricky pattern. But now you've been single for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. You know, I tell people that people who are coming out of a narcissistic relationship, and in you, in your case, it's been a series mm -hmm. of many narcissistic relationships, yeah. right? Is that I tell them, I tell them you got to do Dr. Romney's 12 month detox. And by that, I mean, you got to spend a year alone. Can it be more than 12 alone. months? It can be absolutely more than 12 <laughs> months. And people say, what are you about 12? What's the 12 months of it all? And I said, in that year, you have to encounter every single anniversary date, thing, issue, street corner, restaurant you fought alone, right? And so, and the holidays are tough for people, hmm. right? Holidays, birthdays, um, dates that something happened in your happened in your relationship that had some meaning, Mia and press. Ta yeah, <laughs> take them all back, yeah. and you need a year. A, a lot can happen oh in a gosh, year. Yes. So it, it I is, need more than a year. I, I, and I think more than a year isn't a bad thing, but a minimum of a year. And people are saying, "Are you kidding me?" A year, and I said, "I hear, a year. I know that too." I was like, "If you told me this years ago, I'd be like, I, I'm not talking to you ever mm -hmm. again." No. And a lot of people have said that, like, they're saying no sex, no touch. Yeah. I'm like, yep. And you will, yeah. I mean, even if it's a way of finding self-embrace, yeah. whatever that looks like to you, mm -hmm. but that coming back to yourself because healing from narcissistic abuse the, or narcissistic relationships, the key pillar of that is coming into yourself, mm -hmm. allowing yourself to be an individual outside of the shadow so of anybody else. So it's normal what I'm doing. Ab not only absolutely normal, I'm signing off on it, and I I'm, don't sign off on yeah, much. Thanks. So yes. it's yes. I mean, it is that twelve. Because I'm not even interested. Good. Like good. I don't. Because like, that's great. Is it six years then since I've dated maybe a total of six to seven narcissists? I'm kidding. Yeah, no, no. You, you, you might, you might need longer than a year, my dear. After all, you've <laughs> been through. Definitely, you know? I'm going to tell my therapist this. But it's, it's all good. It's a coming back into <laughs> oneself, and I don't believe a person can go on that journey 
with no. somebody else, right? So I say to people, you don't even know what thermostat setting you like because it was always what they right. wanted, right? You don't know what I didn't you even want know my favorite pizza. color was. You don't was know 21. your favorite color. I have no idea. You don't know anything. Yeah. So you need to go out there and yeah. have all that. What what pizza toppings do you like? Do you even like pizza? Mm-hmm. Do you want the thermostat at 68 or 62 or mm-hmm. 75? What kinds of movies do you like? Yeah. You know, what's I a could perfect actually, Sunday? I'm so proud of myself. I can answer all your questions. That, see, that's great. And a lot of <laughs> folks will say, They'll struggle. They'll they'll say, I know what that is, but, well, and they'll recognize they're still using the narcissistic person as a frame of reference. So that's really what coming out of it is. I could talk, like I said, we could just do a 10-parter to this. This could be a whole season. (laughs) Just Cheryl and Dr. Romney. (laughs) Great. We'll do that. Yeah, that's great. Exactly. Super. Um, No, but this is all very helpful. I love, I just love this all. I love it. Though it's hard to hear sometimes, but it just helps. What was the hardest thing you learned about narcissistic relationships that you had to take in that was necessary for you to push through your healing? I think what was hard for me, first of all, was to wrap my head around the fact that I was only attracted to them. Mm. However, it helps to continue to educate myself by, for example, listening to your podcast and doing more research and it helps to then find the compassion because when you really hear repeatedly over and over again that it has nothing to do with the survivor, you can breathe. It takes a load off. Yeah, I'm actually going to push back on this idea that you say, well, I, I, I've always been attracted to narcissists. I don't actually think or that's I only true. Knew narcissists. I think that they, that, that for was my you, normal? You, mm, you were attempting to work through mm. a pattern, mm. right? If you're to bring people down to some brass tacks, mm. especially trauma survivors, it's the seeking not only of safety, mm-hmm. but of attachment mm-hmm. and of love and of connection, right? Yeah. What you were trying to do was healthy. Mm-hmm. You were trying to bring r- connection into your life, love, attachment, mm-hmm. all of that. Your template was skewed and damaged and harmed mm-hmm, mm-hmm. by trauma. Right, at a young young age. At a young age. Mm-hmm. And so... Then what ends up happening is is that there is a the 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 up and down and the chaos of those relationships is you don't you're not registering them as a problem right 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 and keep in mind too Cheryl I think one of the challenges of narcissistic relationships is it's not terrible every day mm. the good days were really good they were great really good yeah. And, and that's what I would hold on to. Right, obviously. and you'd hold on to that. And then yeah. into huge narratives can well, be Well, that's crafted. why the makeup and breakup was so great, mm-hmm. obviously. Mm-hmm. Then you yeah. got to have it all again mm-hmm. and have it all again. And so that's the. I think that this idea of the narcissistic person as having horns and a forked tail and all of that is nonsense. Mm-hmm. These are incredibly charming, charismatic, fun, interesting people. Charismatic is definitely the yeah. word I mean, that's, to use. That's, yeah. they're, they're very compelling. Mm-hmm. And so be hard on anyone to be hard on themselves for saying, I was drawn to someone who's really interesting, smart, and compelling. Right. That's a normal want. It's the right. also giving yourself permission to say, that might have all been good, but this is not healthy. No. So I yeah. got to disengage from I that. You. For you, that disengagement yeah. was never going to happen because that was still working through right. this other kind of a a cycle. Dr. Jennifer Fried, she talks about this thing Mm -hmm. called betrayal blindness and how when we're being betrayed, you you don't you don't see it. You don't acknowledge it. You almost don't register it. And when you don't do that, the relationship can continue. Hmm. Right. And is it because you're avoiding to see it or you just don't see it? It's not safe to see it. Uh It means you're not going to be able to maintain attachment, connection and love. Like you'll lose something too important. Right. You've had to learn to do that since you were so small. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Right. mm -hmm. Seeing that, having sex through Mm -hmm, a door, mm -hmm. having been Mm -hmm. abused. And in fact, interestingly, in that case, you were willing to acknowledge what it was, which was actually quite remarkable. But, you know, in the sense of you testified in that case. Right, because not everyone right? testified, yeah. You know, but yes, not everyone testified. Yeah. But then in these other relationships in adulthood, you know, treating me badly, cheating on me, whatever mm-hmm. they're doing, it's like whoosh, whoosh. Yeah, and in fact, you use this beautiful analogy of it just whooshes away. Mm-hmm. And when it whooshes away, you can stay in the relationship. But the problem is that comes with an opportunity cost as you kind of just whooshing all this and rubbing all that stuff like away. Right, like, like, you're you're that, yeah, I, I, that's not a thing. Or like, no, okay. Yeah, that's a, they, they, oh, you mean cool. just like, like being blind? Just being uh, literally, what she calls yeah. betrayal blind. Okay, you know, that's okay. how she calls it. Okay. What she refers not like to it pushing as. pushing it away. No. 
but, but just like pretending to not those to betrayals. See it. Got like, it. okay, yeah, we're yeah. good. We're yes, good. Yes. Right? Mm. The problem is, is that we're good. It's not really because this, it's all piling up. And of as course. it piles up, yeah. you're feeling anxious. You're feeling yeah. sad. You're feeling a sense of worthless. despair. You're drinking. Yeah. Yes. You're feeling worthless. So yeah. all this unhealthy stuff is coming up behind it. But you keep having that not yeah, acknowledging, like not acknowledging, not acknowledging. Yeah. And then one day you acknowledge. In each of those relationships, those six, seven relationships, something happened. And like you said, I, you'd quickly pivot into a new relationship. Mm. But something ended it. Maybe you kind of saw it. But it seems like now, mm. after all you've been through, being in therapy, yeah. you are now able to see, oh, that person cheated on me. Oh, that oh. person mistreated yes. me. And you can't unsee it. it. Yes. Right. Yeah. And it then you can't healing, unsee though. it. No. No, right? no, no, no. And I, but it was interesting. The very first uh, physical abusive uh, relationship was pretty bad that and and then it was interesting how i was blind to seeing like the welts on my legs yeah. and yeah that's it you know that's it. i'm not right. i'm not processing it but now i'm so sensitive to mm -hmm. any type of mm -hmm. emotional abuse let alone mm -hmm. it wouldn't they the person wouldn't even dare to touch mm -hmm. me but um i maybe it's an overreaction but i don't think it is it's just a you know for me it's a boundary that you just don't cross mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's I am, great and whether what whatever mm -hmm. and right away it's a red flag so then i leave like it's just like you're done in two seconds so a uh, uh, last few questions sure ask, okay you've you've worked on your mental health you've worked through a lot of your trauma you are you're maintaining sobriety how is all of that going for you especially in light of you mm -hmm. you've gone through some major relationship yeah. changes and you know and and leaving dancing with the mm -hmm, stars mm -hmm. these are two big changes for you yes okay yeah so how do you balance you know all of the healing against these two major transitions i don't think it's separate okay. I, I i think that the reason why i did leave both situations you just mentioned mm -hmm. is because of the fact that i'm healing mm -hmm. okay and i think that it works hand in hand yes it does but it's it scary as yeah. shit. Mm -hmm. And it, I'm not going to say that my sobriety has been easy and that mm -hmm. I'm healed because it's uh, it's going to be a lifelong mm -hmm. battle and pr and amazingness sometimes and not so amazing sometimes. And I just my job is just to uh, d take this life one day at a time. Mm -hmm. Well, it is a lifelong battle. And I think yeah. that that's the reality of it, that there will be those dark nights of the soul. But it's not a battle, I guess. It's, no, I think it's, it's a journey. Not. It's a process. It is. And, and it's, it's like yeah. it's it's heavy as shit. Mm -hmm. And it's exhausting, but there's more days of not feeling like that mm -hmm. than if mm -hmm. I were just to wing it. Yeah, life. Yeah, that's you know? great. I mean, and that's progress. And that you. And now more than what I hear that's so promising is that you acknowledge what happened, right? If mm -hmm. we talked to you, like you said, nine years ago, it, you you you, you wouldn't I, even I have been like what? And and I would then, have been offended and right. defensive about everything Correct. you would have right? said. Right. And yeah. then and that just simply means you weren't in that yeah. moment of readiness, just like you had with your therapist. She'd mm -hmm. bring it up. You're like, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. And for any of us who are therapists, like, okay, not. I mean, ready. I think there's certain things I'm still you know? not ready to talk about. And you'll get most there, most likely, right? You know, you'll get there. Are you? So how do you feel about getting into a new relationship? Not. Not. Okay. So that's it's me, <laughs> myself, and my friend. And your dog. <laughs> I love that. Okay. And, Listen, and I am just currently. Look, there's moments of feeling lonely, but I'm more alone than lonely. Like, I'm not lonely. I agree. There's a big like, difference. Like, I actually crave yeah. being alone now. That's great. Um, and I guess, too, I am, like, I'm not for small talk anymore. Like, there's a lot of things that I'm mm -hmm. learning about myself. It becomes a very small, tiny little group of people. That's great. Since I got sober, my whole everything's changed. But also, as hard as I have been curious to work, um, it my every a lot's changed, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I'm proud of myself. And I don't think I could have ever said that. Which is great because I, I think that what you're saying is though is that you're able to in in being alone, you feel safe, mm, and that's more a big safe deal. Than being with like, yeah, yes, right. And there was a time yes. when you didn't feel safe no. when you were alone. That's a huge. Sort of a transitional, yeah. you know, sort no, of a right. leap, which you're is right. really, really yeah. great. You're also talking about discernment. You have a small group of friends. That is about discernment, that mm. not anyone can get through the gate. Yeah. And that's a big a deal for survivors, right? Boundaries in general yes, is boundaries a big in general. deal for me. Yeah. <laughs> but say that again. You said you're proud of yourself. Yeah, no, I am really it's... proud of myself. I, I, I love myself. Like, I actually do. Mm -hmm. And the more I continue to make these decisions, whether they be big, small, or however mm -hmm. you want to measure it um it's it had to be done mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in order for me mm -hmm. to continue on this yeah. path of healing because if i continued in any no. type of relationship or workplace with feeling like i'm not being respected 
or um, treated the way I should be, mm-hmm. I'm leaving. Which is, again, we're back to discernment, mm-hmm. which is a huge part mm-hmm. of healing from these relationships. And I have to say, listen, nobody else can do sixth grade for you, right? You got to go through right. the pain of all of algebra and whatever <laughs> yeah. you got to do in sixth grade. Yeah. It's the same thing with this. I think that when a person can get through this, they can see it. Mm-hmm. They have the supports. They have therapy. Mm-hmm. They have friends. They have Just resources, activities yeah. that they love yes. to do. I love to diamond a, a, paint. A, you know, perfect. Big you know, diamond painter over diamond here. Painting, arts and crafts. Who arts knew? and crafts, which is great. You have your pup. You have <laughs> yes. all those things. Busy. And all, <laughs> that, kidding. I have to tell you, one thing I don't know that I'm going to ever be able to do is my fantasy has always been I could help people get ahead of it. I could teach people how to identify these patterns and mm. stop them from ever getting in the first place. I'm oh, not seeing that happen. Goal. You know, most yeah. people say they, anyone who hasn't been through it, they are no interest no. in what I have to say. No. And then when they go through and I, I hate to say it, but I'm like, mm, Everybody's going to say it's going to come by this bus stop <laughs> yeah. soon enough. No, you're so right. don't you worry about you're that. Right. And if and you don't, yeah. you're just but it's, living. It's yeah. tough. It, it's almost yeah. like telling a teenager, don't do this, don't do this. You have to just hope yes. that, I yeah, call it sort of harm reduction. At least, how can we make your fall mm. as soft as possible? Because you're going to fall. It's going to be gonna a, make the mistake. either a so, hardcore, you know, but it's not so, black or white. Yeah, yeah it's mm-hmm. going to be, you're falling. Yeah. We're falling. Fall. Lo- <laughs> your story is amazing because you you've been through it and you are so self-reflective on what happened and how it Mm -hmm. happened and even the parts of it that were enticing and you own it and and you've you know you've come to this place i don't think Mm -hmm. you could come to this place without in some ways sadly walking through some of these steps and that's i mean this is actually a really big deal i don't cry but like i'm trying just to feel and so thank you for it's amazing everything. you don't thank know how many you. people need to hear this thank you because it's it's really it's it's, it's remarkable when i hear someone come thank all you. the way you came thank so you. thank you thank you for everything you do well i i'm so happy <laughs> you're the new say, oprah no, who knew uh, <laughs> I think a touch more cynical than Darling Oprah, but I think that you know what we need a cynical Oprah yeah. in our new. Yes, that's the and new an world Asian order. Oprah. And, like, there, no, and I mean, two yeah. Asian Oprah, exactly. South Asian, exactly. We got it. And you know what? There's more people in Asia than anywhere else. So you're we've right. got the viewership, amen, sister. So that's what and I'm. You saying. are a sister. Yes, <laughs> and you amen. and you are too. And I can't dance a step. So maybe one day you can teach me. I will. That's right. I and will. then I can keep teaching you about uh, narcissism. As long as I have trade. these free sessions, we're good. You I'll got teach it. you a cha-cha Great. any day. Great. Here are my takeaways from my conversation with Cheryl. First, people often think that finding love is the ultimate sign of success and healing. However, for many people, it actually may be a period of solitude. Cheryl's story shows us that getting to know who you are outside of a relationship is the true summit of healing. Your process might not look like everyone else's, and that's okay. In our next takeaway, Cheryl talked about stalking being enticing. Now, what she's calling stalking may be that obsessive, intrusive, unrelenting interest, the constant checking in, or the incessant need to pull someone back into a relationship. Cheryl's feelings are common. As a psychologist, I've seen many people shamed for admitting that they found this behavior appealing. For people like Cheryl, who have acknowledged attachment issues, this intense interest can feel like an antidote to the fear of abandonment and create a false sense of security, but unfortunately will lead to a very unhealthy and toxic relationship. In this next takeaway, Cheryl found that understanding attachment styles was very helpful Understanding attachment behaviors means going back to early childhood. Remember, children need attachment to survive. But if there are early disruptions in these attachments, that will have implications for our adult relationships. There are believed to be four types of adult attachment styles. The first is secure. These are folks who are able to make mutual, safe, and sustained relationships, are not preoccupied with being abandoned or with rejection while they're in relationships, and are comfortable with closeness. 
The second is the avoidant attachment style, which looks like someone who is not comfortable with being or getting close and may feel that they don't need their partner. People with this attachment style may pull away when people try to get close. With the third style, the anxious attachment style, this is someone who feels insecure about close relationships, even as they want these relationships. There can be a real fear of abandonment or rejection and a belief that they overwhelm partners with their needs for closeness. And finally, there's also the anxious avoidant mix, where people are not only not comfortable with close relationships, but they are also anxious about the relationship. So trust and a fear of getting close to a partner are issues. It can be useful to know your attachment style as well as your partner's if you're in a relationship, because it can give you insight about how you move through relationships and the cycles you get stuck into. Having a history of narcissistic parents or early trauma can definitely put a person at risk for anxious avoidant or anxious avoidant attachment styles, and having an anxious or an avoidant anxious attachment style can also put you at risk for getting stuck in unhealthy antagonistic and narcissistic relationship cycles. You aren't doomed, and therapy can be an important place to explore these patterns within yourself and establish secure attachment skills you can take into close relationships. In our show notes, you'll find a quiz that can help you determine your attachment style. In this next takeaway, Cheryl shared that for a while, healthy people who could offer her a healthy relationship disgusted her. And that is not unusual, especially if someone is prone to trauma bonding and has a relationship template that love is rejection and chaos and invalidation, and of actually finding comfort in the breakup, makeup, reunion cycles. It makes sense and it is part of what she observed at a young age, but we are not defined by our histories. It does take work to make the transition to experiencing these less volatile and chaotic relationships as satisfying. And that work often has to be done while we are not in a relationship and through psychotherapy. And for our last takeaway, Cheryl shared that she is single now and has been for over a year after an adult life of only being in relationships. Solitude is an essential part of healing from narcissistic relationships. And I wasn't kidding when I talked about a 12-month detox, a period of time when you are out of a romantic relationship and learning about yourself and learning how to be with yourself without a relationship, to become familiar with who you are without having to shape yourself to what someone else needs you to be. This development of identity, autonomy, and sense of self can be stolen if you have been in nonstop narcissistic relationships from a young age and spending time on your own, overwhelming as it may feel, is essential to healing. Relationships can be a place to hide, numb, and not do the work of becoming our authentic selves. It's a chance for your nervous system to take a rest and for you to be able to focus on your emotions and your whole self.